Hello friends! Welcome back to Emily Finally Reads All of Her Books. I actually finished 172 hours this book about a week ago, and I initially recorded a video detailing the play-by-play -play of the entire plot, and that video was sitting at about 25 minutes. And, uh, I don't know about you guys, but even I wouldn't want to watch a 25-minute video of me rambling on about a bunch of teens on the moon. I mean, why watch that when you could watch a 20-something video about a teen turning into the moon? Really bad way of talking about Avatar, this amazing show. If you haven't watched it, you definitely should. It's on Netflix. I love it with all of my soul. Ideally, I would watch it all in one sitting, but someone thinks that that's impractical. So let's talk about this book. I'm going to give a much briefer synopsis and then give my opinions on it. We open with this mysterious doctor at some unspecified government meeting talking about wanting to send people up to this super secret moon base called Darla 2 that up until this point has been completely secret and no one has known about it. I asked a friend of mine who studies like these astrophysics and space and rockets and all that kind of stuff, the feasibility of having a moon base hidden in the Sea of Tranquility no less. And he said it was uh, basically impossible. Then he started talking about the logistics of carrying everything up to the moon and the cost of everything and, and how it would actually be built in like the super low gravity. And I'm just a theater major, so he's telling me all this and I'm just sitting there like... Uh-huh. The team of people who will be sent up to the moon consists of three teenagers and five actual astronauts. Our three teens are Mia from Norway, who's not like other girls. She plays in a band. It's super cool. Midori from Japan, who just really wants to travel the world and become a free spirit. And then Antoine from France. And I'm going to call him Andy for the rest of this, so I don't have to say a name in a French accent because I don't respect the French. Going with them are five astronauts. We have Coleman, the man with the mysterious past. We have Chelsea, the much younger astronaut who's very cool, and she has a cool taste in music too, so she and Mia hit it off like right away. And then three nameless astronauts, we don't really care about them. With these characters, I'm sort of forced to do a little bit of mental gymnastics because of this massive language barrier. Like, you have a Norwegian who is a Scandinavian language, you have Japanese, which is its own language tree, and then you have French, which, which is a romantic language, and they're all working on an American project which is going to be in English, which is Germanic-based, and I'm sure they know a little bit of English, but nowhere near enough to really understand what's going to be going on. Like, I'm a native English speaker, and, and when my astrophysics friend is talking to me about projects that he's working on, I even get lost, like, 90% of the time. So during the first half of this book, while we're getting all of the character introduction, while we're getting all of the plot and exposition, we occasionally jump to the point of view of this, like, 90-year-old guy in some retirement home. He's, like, super senile. We find out he worked for NASA when he was younger doing custodial work. And so, of course, that means he was super in the know with all this top-secret information, such as Darla 2. And I don't know how it is across the board, but I've worked custodial before. If they find out you're looking at anything in the building, like if you're looking at the papers on the desk, or you're looking at the books in the shelves, or heaven forbid you look in a computer, you will get in so much trouble. Like one of my coworkers, she made a comment about something she saw on one of the bulletin boards and she was like fired within a week. So just this crazy old guy has all these memories and information about this super top secret moon base. <sighs> and like he tries to get in contact with the mysterious doctor from the prologue, but he ends up falling and hitting his head and dying. And it just kind of happens. I I'll talk about him more later. So back to the main plot, the astronauts and the teenagers, they get to the moon base, everything is pretty cool, the trip goes well, they're really excited, yada yada yada. However, during the first call back to Earth, the power goes out and an alarm goes off, so obviously something is wrong. We thus move into the horror portion of this book, and as someone who really enjoys like suspense and horror movies and books, I was like, 
So two of the nameless astronauts, they go to check on the generator to see if anything is up there. Luckily, right before this, we get a super in-depth flashback for one of the astronauts talking about his wife, his family, their excitement for him going back to space, and all that kind of stuff. So reading that, of course you think that this character is going to live a very long and happy life. But then, uh, whoops, they get trapped and are running out of oxygen, so they decide to just take off their helmets together. And, like, they hold hands as they take off their helmets. It's really quite romantic. We then get our first exposition dump of the book. Coleman tells us that Darla 2, surprisingly, isn't actually the first moon base. Darla 1 is nearby. Not only does it have extra power that they could use, it also has means of escape, which is really helpful for them. Obviously. We also find out that these moon bases were initially built as a sort of final solution for the Cold War between the United States and Russia. Because, you know, as they say, if you can't beat them, just blow up the moon. So our dear French friend Andy and the last nameless astronaut, they take a couple of the lunar rovers and they start heading off to Darla 1. And wouldn't you know it, they get lost, and then their rovers stop working, and then they see something off in the distance. You guessed it, aliens. But not just aliens. Doppelganger aliens! Back to Darla 2, me and Midori are at the base, and they see Andy through the window, but like without his suit, so they're like, what the heck is going on? Chelsea goes out to see what's going on, and she immediately gets killed by Andy's doppelganger. Nice! Me and Midori are obviously freaked out, and so they go and look for Coleman, our local expositoriator. Exposit... That's a word now. And he decides to tell them everything that he knows. Thus begins exposition dump number two. The U.S. government does know about these weird doppelganger creatures, and they just still sent people up there to the moon. They're just like, you know, they'll be fine. After this exposition dump, Coleman shoots himself in the head, you know, as you do. So me and Midori have to walk their way over to Darla 1 in order to escape. And then we find out, once they do get to Darla 1, oh no, Midori's been switched out with her doppelganger. When did it happen? It isn't clear, but it happened. So Mia has to fight off Midori's doppelganger. After that, she has to fight her own doppelganger in order to get into the escape chute rocket thing. We get back to Earth and everything seems to be okay. Mia is reunited with her family and everything is going seemingly back to normal when, oh no, it turns out it was actually Mia's doppelganger. That Mia was left back in Darla 1 on the moon. Why did I say it like that? We then fast forward about a century to the notes of another astronaut team as they are visiting the moon. They find the bodies of all the astronauts, including Andy Midori and Mia, who they recognize as looking very similar to that weird creature that seemed to take over the Earth around the year 2019. Which, honestly, I would prefer a doppelganger takeover to what we've had to deal with in the past few months. That would have been a much better 2019 into 2020, in my opinion. And that's 172 Hours by Johan Harstead. All right, let's give some opinions. Did I like this book? It was, it was okay. It, it was definitely an easy read. It probably reads at about an eighth or ninth grade level. There were at times some places where it read a little differently and I'm sure that just has to do with the difficulty of the translation since it was originally written in Norwegian. My main issue with this book were the motivations, or I suppose the lack thereof. Like when we're introduced to the mysterious doctor at the very beginning of the book, he never gives a very specific reason why people are being sent back to the moon. They talk about this super rare mineral that they want to mine, but that seems very shady. Like it just feels like he has ulterior motives and it's just never really explained what those other motives could be. And then we have the antagonists, the doppelgangers. We don't know what they want. Like at one point Coleman hypothesizes, like, oh, they just want to take our place on Earth. But that's never confirmed nor denied. And then another issue, we have the resilient old man. He gives the vague sense of worry and horror with, with the things that he knows and his memories. But honestly, I don't really feel like we needed that. I mean, with a cover like this, with the creepy eye and the, ooh, make it back alive, 
we don't need any like hand holding with knowing what kind of story we're going into. And besides, even with all of his memories, we still would have gotten all that exposition anyway. We, we just didn't really need this extra sense of foreboding from this character. And then the twist at the end with it actually being Mia's doppelganger instead of the real Mia, that was definitely unexpected. But then I went back and I reread the scene where they supposedly switched places and I was still really confused. The book just kind of plays the pronoun game for a little while, so you're just misled. And maybe it was just another difficulty in translation, but eh. Alright, so my score, I give it a six and a half out of ten. Did I enjoy it? Yes. Would I read it again? Probably not. Therefore, off to DI you go. The next book that I'm going to be reading is Legally Blonde. It's for another project that I'm working on about adaptations and how characters and situations and motivations can change across different adaptations. I'm going to be comparing the book to the movie to the film. Hey friends, I'm editing. I meant to say that I would be comparing the book to the movie to the musical. Can't really compare a movie to a film. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. And seeing how everything kind of merges and blends together and all that kind of stuff. I'm excited. So yeah, that was the first book. I hope you all enjoy. I need to figure out what I'm going to do for an outro. But uh, bye! <laughs>